as much as we had Moore's Law on desktop and then we had Moore's Law on mobile, there are real legitimate laws of physics that people start hitting or chips start hitting up against. And we have like three nanometer and angstrom beyond that. But it seems like we are hitting the limits of what these thermal enclosures, these increasingly small and elegant thermal enclosures, even up to and including desktop towers can actually handle. And we've seen uh, some companies just go all in on adding power and adding cores. And we've seen other companies start considering off big core features, you know, like dedicated silicon engines for specific tasks. Where do you see that playing out? Do you think there's still a lot of room to grow the main cores? Or do you think we're going to be seeing more off core features in the future? Yeah, so there's a couple of ways that I think the the industry is addressing this. Um, you know, everybody's acknowledging the point that that you said is that we're we're up against real challenges trying to make these things smaller. Um, it's not even just the physics; it's also really expensive. So it's kind of hard to throw the economies of needed R and D. You know, again, a long time ago, not a long time ago, but let's say 10, 15 years ago, it used to be. 10 to 12 billion dollars right for for a new fab um that's now north of 20 and you see tsmc and even intel now spending 35 40 billion a year in r d to to increase their potential right with future through future process notes so there is a engineering challenge and there is an economic challenge and i think both of those things are are challenges that the industry is trying to solve now what's interesting is um, a lot of people, so Intel, uh, even AMD, um, you know, we'll be curious to see how Apple starts to ta attack this as well, is starting to take on these chiplet architectures where they're essentially stacking chips as well as different process technologies, basically using the best, best process technology for the need. So let's say, for example, that seven nanometer is better for GPU than three, then they'll use a seven nanometer GPU stack. Then they'll use a three nanometer CPU stack and whatever, a five for a microcontroller, you name it, right? But they're mixing and matching architectures and process. And it's a really creative way to solve this problem, to be honest with you. The, the benefits that an AMD is seeing in performance per watt and, 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 and the capabilities is actually pretty significant. And Intel will have products like that in, in 2024 as well. So you're going to see rubber meet the road, how, how effective and efficient those architectures are there's a lot of optimism for them but that's one of the more creative ways people are let's call it extending Moore's life or 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 halting the slowdown of it and again having some economic ability to um not be as expensive to make right so keep cost per transistor flat ish by doing these solutions and also still get really good economies of scale pricing from fabs they're working with that are still willing to monetize their later end processes. So I, I feel like that's here to stay. Um, again, how much Apple dives in on that versus the x86, like Qualcomm's not doing that yet, but my, my, my assumption is they will at some point. Um, obviously the big cores here might matter a little bit more than the small cores that go in your watch or your, or your smartphone. So we're talking about compute. Um, but yeah, this chiplet architecture is, is kind of the way I think people are going to navigate these waters over the next few years and deal with the, the problems that, that you brought up. And it's interesting, too, because for a long time, just the, the process was what everybody talked about. It got to the point where it was mostly marketing names, not even actual physical measurements anymore. But we saw Intel yeah. famously having to push out their process node improvements for years and years. But then more recently, TSMC too, like we had five nanometer, sure, but then five nanometer, like, like uh, N5P. And then we had N4P, which is basically N5PP. And now we have N4P, which is N5PPP, I think. Like I'm losing track now. And like you have Nuvia cores, which are like the future, always coming, but never quite arriving. So we've seen like, or ARMv9, which is like, who's going to adopt it and where? Do you think we're getting past the era of like these simple measurements or these simple things to, for people to grasp onto and getting to more subtle and sophisticated improvements? Yeah, I, I mean, I've, I've sort of been an advocate and you and I have talked about this for a while. Um, you know, pr process technology was great, but that's just not the way to think about the world anymore. Um, everybody in leading edge silicon design from name the company that I've talked to is is really embracing this this whole point that how you package these things together is going to matter more than the process. And that's where packaging makes a really big deal when you're doing this 
mixing and matching of, of process technologies in this chiplet architecture. And so I, I think you're about to see a very similar explosion in innovation and packaging technology that will outpace that of process technology. And so getting wrapped up in what process it is, I think really only matters to the degree that that process is good at something or better than a different yeah. process, right? That, that's why I say, you know, you could use the GPU on a later end process, or you could do the NPU on a later edge process and maybe see more benefit than if that whole thing was just on one, call it two nanometer, right? Or three nanometer process. So that's where the packaging gets really interesting. That, that similarly is a very hard problem and also expensive, although it's not as expensive as building a, a, a two, two nanometer fab in, in China or, or Arizona. Um, but a lot of really interesting engineering is going to work. And, and that's where the foundries shine, right? So AMD doesn't have to deal with that. TSMC does and Intel does or Samsung does. They are the ones that have to solve these really hard and complex packaging problems. But I, I like to look at this more as where will innovation come in packaging that lets us do these interesting things and sort of let go of this, this need to keep you know focusing on process because it's important, but I just don't think it's the most important thing anymore, like it has been the past, you know, 15, 20 years. Yeah, it's almost like, uh, as with the rest of technology, feature sets are becoming more important than technology, or sorry, the features delivered as being more important than the technology used to deliver them. One of the reasons why I've always been so pro on Apple's um, and, and bullish on Apple's approach with silicon design is because their fundamental philosophy is to custom design every bit of that chip for those needs. So just imagine now that Apple can say, well, let's custom use every bit of process for the right needs. Like they may even get more efficiency than by taking a chiplet approach than, than they can just a basic, you know, straight process driven um, SOC. So people, people who really are trying to own those bits and customize and develop and leverage technology, the right process or the right package or the right chip for the right workload are going to see the best benefits there. And, and, and the reason that I say that's interesting is because it all brings it back to design, right? The silicon designers and engineers are the ones who will run this competitive battle. The better you are at designing silicon and then putting all of these pieces, these puzzle pieces together, the better you will be at differentiating and bringing cutting edge features to your, to your customer. So again, really interesting in all of those things. It comes back to how good can you design things? That's not everybody. Um, so it puts, again, an added lens on the competitive nature of the silicon landscape. And it's interesting too, like you mentioned Apple, you know, for a long time, they started off licensing ARM core designs, but they increasingly customized their CPUs, their GPUs until now. It's almost a completely custom uh, package, except with like a really thin Qualcomm modem on it. And we've seen Google move from Qualcomm chips and modems to now uh, building out their tensor processing units, which is using a lot of Samsung IP, but decreasingly each year. Uh, Samsung modems now, no Qualcomm modems anymore. Um, and then we're seeing MediaTek, I think, making a big splash this year, doing junkets for the first time the way Qualcomm has famously done it. But it, it feels like they're, the competition between uh, merchant silicon vendors and integrated players, both of them are just increasing now. Yeah, I mean, I think, again, this comes back to the nature of ARM. That's an interesting discussion, right? I mean, there's been a long debate like, okay, so will the, will the future of ARM be based on those who are just general architecture licensees? So MediaTek, the big one, right? Or, or, or is it going to be controlled by those who really do design their own architectures? Qualcomm, Apple, um, you know, Ampere in the data center. So th these are the conversations that I think are, are relevant. Um, I, I, again, I tend to think that the world's run, again, I don't know how contrary of an opinion this is, but I really do think that these walled garden silicon approaches of true architectures designed specifically by the design teams in, a, in their own architectures, I, I just feel like those have a lot more benefit than kind of the standard off the shelf sort of features, not to downplay MediaTek's doing some interesting stuff, but, but I do think that they will run up against a wall in higher performance, higher capability devices by those who do design their own architectures, right? So, so that's where I, I tend to be more biased towards those who do. You know, again, to your, to your modem point, right? You've got a handful of people that can make modems. Um, you know, yeah. Apple still uses now more modems from Qualcomm. That's gone back and forth. Clearly, they'll probably make one at their own point in time, north of 2025. But again, that's because they want to control 
the very specific parts that that benefit the user experience. Um, but 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 you still have to have people like this is the thing that I always try to bring up, right? As great as it is to understand Apple's capabilities in silicon, which again are 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 pretty advanced to the competition, you still have to have somebody who helps the rest of the industry compete with Apple. And so the question is, who is that going to be? Right now, it's mostly Qualcomm and Intel still in x86, and then in compute, those things will merge, right? When Qualcomm gets into compute, into C, into bigger into CPUs with custom architectures and Intel and AMD. But the point is that if you're name your blanket vendor, you don't make your own silicon. You're you're at the mercy of these others who need to do process design, package, and push the industry forward so that we do have a really balanced competitive environment. And that that whole fundamental stone of of competition comes back to the silicon. What can you do with these chips that are being provided to you from software development to cloud development to core computes, all relative to that silicon? Yeah, and it's interesting because we're seeing in mobile now, because they are running up against the same kinds of physical walls that desktop did years ago, we're seeing Qualcomm use heat dissipation technology, which is something that you didn't use to see in mobile. And we're seeing Apple use more and more cores, which means those cores get hot faster and they have to ramp down much faster. Uh, and But it does help with those bursty workloads, which is the whole controversy we had on desktop when Intel changed the sort of the way that they talked about frequency and turbo. And that is you go really, really fast and really, really hot for small amounts of time that help instantaneous performance, but aren't great for sustained performance. And now those same sorts of things are playing out on mobile. Yeah, and I think again, right, this comes down to how good you can design um, even little weird innovations that are happening in power management now, right? So like, what can you offload to a dedicated kind of discrete feature or function, right? Because because to your first question, right, I, I don't think that this means that that everything resides on the SOC. I think there's good reasons that you would offload workloads for power management, things around security, even things around AI. There are very good reasons to move some of that off your core chip, whether that's a small chip for phones or a big chip for you know computers and, and data centers. So again, the, the way that you architect these solutions becomes the architecture that is the single chip itself but also the solution of how those chips all work together for maximum performance, um, you know, to, to do, like you said, a sustained workload, then throttle down quickly. That's the designers, right, that do that. And to some degree, mixing and matching of process can help, right, bring those workloads down to small cores versus big cores. But that's the creativity of, of that design team that really, right, the future of, of every company's differentiation is hinged on their silicon design team, at least everybody who makes, who makes processors. And that's going to be the battle, right? Who has the best designers across the board and who can create really creative solutions to these very hard problems? Because we want to throw a bunch of compute at our phones. Someday, right, we believe we maybe wear smart glasses. Well, yes. you're going to want them to do some crazy amount of compute in a, in a thing that's exceptionally small. The only way you do that is with very, very good designers using cutting edge technology, solving hard problems by creatively solving these solutions for power management um, diffusion, whatever it is, like these are higher, big problems to solve, but it comes back to the designers and the engineering team to do it. You mentioned earlier, you know, chip fabs, Taiwan chip fabs in Arizona. There's always these ongoing concerns about having so much of the fabrication capabilities residing in Taiwan. And there is this uh, increased desire to sort of spread that out more over the world. How do you see that evolving over the next little while? Yeah, so I mean, it's it's really right. There's three foundries that can kind of meet the needs of leading edge compute. It's 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 TSMC and Samsung and, and Intel. Um, they're the only three really committing to foundry work and to pushing the envelope in next generation process. Um, you know, again, Samsung makes has a pretty big foundry here in the United States, as does Intel, obviously, and TSMC is now starting to invest more for you know four nanometer and three nanometer and probably beyond in in the United States as well and it, and obviously that's good because one we want foundry um, diversification right you don't want to be beholden to one foundry who runs away with this like let's just say that it's, that TSMC was the only company that can get to two nanometer right just for sake of argument yeah. Intel never figures it out and nor does nor does Samsung well they could charge whatever they want right they could exorbitantly charge not to say <laughs> that they would but theoretically, they could charge whatever they want to Apple and to AMD and to Amazon. And that's just not a good competitive environment, right? You want there to be 
diversity and balance. So the first the first point is we want those regardless of where they reside in the world, you want diversity. Secondly, though, there is this concern about where they reside. And this is not just to do with TSMC's um, you know, geographical position being Taiwan and the conflicts they have with China, but more so to the point that from a United States perspective, the government could mandate that you just can't use foreign technologies for yeah. X percent of your bomb. Okay, so if that happens, then you need to have a domestic equivalent, right? You need to be investing in onshoring so that you're not hit with a giant tax by your government because you get all your chips from China. So there's the two, there's the competitive diversity, and then there's a the geopolitical part of this that comes into play. And I think that's why you're seeing, obviously, the CHIPS Act, um, as well as more pressure come from governments and industry leaders to really make sure that the United States has the United States option. Um, but that's not to take away from the work that will still be, be done in China, because again, you do want diversity. And ultimately, right, there is no country who can make 100% of everything they need. So san saner minds prevailing is that the world just needs to understand it relies on each other for silicon. Yeah. But you have these political tensions and then technology differences that still have to get resolved in that meantime. With Robert Iger coming back to Disney, I'm re-listening to The Ride of a Lifetime, which includes all of the lessons he learned from his previous 15 years as CEO, which, I mean, not only did he inherit the Magic Kingdom, he bought Pixar and Marvel and Lucasfilm and was on Apple's board of directors until very recently. And that just puts him at the confluence, the epicenter of so many of my interests and probably yours as well. And that's why I've been an Audible member for almost as long as there's been Audible memberships. It's the best stories from the best storytellers, audiobooks, podcasts, and originals, from bestsellers to new releases, memoirs of the rich and famous to secrets of the most successful. And as an Audible member, you can choose one title a month to keep from the whole entire catalog, including the latest and the greatest. Members also get full access to an ever-growing selection of audiobooks, podcasts, and originals to stream or download as much as you want. You can even listen to the latest podcasts like Stephen Fry's Inside Your Mind right in the Audible app. New members can try it out free for 30 days. Just visit audible.com slash Renee Ritchie or text Renee Ritchie to 500-500. That's audible.com slash Renee Ritchie or text Renee Ritchie to 500-500 to try Audible free for 30 days. audible.com slash Renee Ritchie. Thank you so much for your support.